Hi, can I just check? Um, can people see the slides on the screen at all? Um, you, you can type in the chat at the bottom to see if you can, or you can actually speak if you want to. Thanks, guys. Is that is that better now? Is it not obscured anymore? Great. That's fine. Okay, I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes before we start. But in the meantime, if anybody's got any questions or anything they um, want to know, just uh, either type it in the chat room or feel free to talk away and quite happy to, to answer anything um, people uh, have. These sessions are designed to be quite informal, so just let me know.
Okay, I, I guess um, that's long enough. I should uh, we should start this this now. So uh, my name's Adrian Jackson, and I'm uh, part of the central support team um, for Archer here at EPCC. Uh, and this is a virtual one of the vir training virtual tutorials. Um, so the idea here is that there is space for people to come along and ask any questions they may have, either from using the system or from attending some of the training. Uh, but also, we like to try and give them a little bit of a theme, a little bit of structure. So today, I'm going to talk about the file systems we have on Archer. Um, but please, um, these are designed to be reasonably informal. So if you have any questions, uh, either put them in the chat window or just uh, use your microphone and, and speak to us, and, and we will um, discuss what you have. Um, if you can't hear me properly, if there's any problems with the sound or the slides, please just let me know as as well. Um, I will endeavour to try and keep up with any chat that's put in the chat window. It may take me a minute or two to notice it. So um, I've only got 10, 15 slides, so it should only really take sort of 15 or 20 minutes for this bit. And then, as I say, if you have any questions after that, uh, we'll be around. I'll be around for um, an hour or two uh, on this. So if you have detailed questions or we're just wondering about things to do, do let us know. And if you have any questions, as I say, just ask us as we go along. Um, so, what what is uh, what are the file systems in Archer, and, and why should you care about them? Well, this picture, hopefully, you can see the slides. This picture we have on the screen now is just sort of one of the generic pictures we show of Archer, trying to describe all the different hardware components that you may be interested in. So, on the left hand side, we have external network so that's likely where you're doing your work your 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 computers that you're sat at will be connected to Archer via an external network and the thing that users normally see of Archer are the login nodes so there's I can't remember exactly how many of them I think maybe eight nodes which are designed specifically for users to log into compile their jobs on look at files and these these kind of these kind of things, um, and those are called the login nodes. Then we have a set of the main system nodes called compute nodes, and on Archer there are 3,008 of these, which, which give us our 72,000 and some cores. Um, and associated with them are a small set of other bits of hardware. So there's some things called gateway nodes, and if you came along to our virtual tutorial last month where David Henty was talking about PBS and job launching on Archer, then um, he talked a little bit about their, those their gateway nodes are the um, places where your job is launched from. So you sit in a login node, you submit a job using the batch system using PBS, and it gets sent away to a gateway node which then actually launches it on a compute node. And then over on the right hand side, we have things called LNet nodes and a separate box which has the Lustre file system. And so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff on the, on the right hand side, um, the, the file system and, 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 and how you care about it, why, why, why you would care about it, what impact it may have on the performance. Um, but this is quite a simplistic diagram. So actually, it doesn't show all the file systems we have on Archer. It doesn't show you everything you need to know. So in essence, we have three distinct file systems associated with Archer. And the first one is what we call slash home. And this is a file system which is, is probably quite familiar to people who are who are working in universities or companies using Linux or Unix systems. This is just a network file system. It's a place where you can access your data from any of the login nodes. So you log into any of the login nodes, and you can see your files and, and uh, directories. It's backed up, and it's a reasonable size file system. It's, it's more than 200 terabytes there, but it's not huge for a system like Archer. We have a second file system, the work file system, we call slash work. And this is designed to be a high performance 
file system. So this is designed to to um, give you uh, very good I/O, so reading and writing of files from the compute nodes on the system. This is much bigger than the home file system, so more than four petabytes. Um, as I say, it's based on, on Lustre, which is a high performance file system. And then the third file system, which is not directly part of Archer, but is, actually, is coincidentally in the same building as Archer, is called the RDF, the Research Data Facility. And this is um, a, a, a quite a big file system, um, uses something that's called GPFS, but we don't need to care about that. Um, and it's designed for long term data storage. And particularly across high performance computer systems. So it's designed to sit there, you know, Archer may be here for a few years and then go away and there might be another machine somewhere else. The RDF is designed to be a, a large amount of data storage sitting um, in one place permanently, which you can access from outside and move your data uh, between. Um, so I'm just going to go through each of these file systems in turn and tell you what you need to know about them. But as I said before, if you have any questions, just let me know, either through the chat window or, 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 just, or just speak to me. So the first file system I mentioned was the home file system. The important thing to know about this one is, there are two, sorry, there are two important things to know about this one. One is you can't see any data on the home file system from the compute nodes. So when you write a batch uh, batch script and you submit a job to the compute nodes, to the main system, these 3008 compute nodes, what happens is the batch system, it looks at the script you've written, it works out what executable you want to run and it goes away and it runs that on the compute nodes. But those compute nodes cannot see any of the home file system at all. And quite often, particularly if you're new to using a system like Archer, you'll try and run a, a job on Archer and it will submit it to a batch system fine and then it will come back with an error when it runs saying something like can't find file or directory in slash home slash something slash something. And that's because you've tried to run um, a program on the compute nodes which is looking for data on the home file system and it can't see it. They're physically sitting on two different networks and you can't, from the compute node, you can't see the home file system. So having said that, the second important thing to know about the home file system is that it's backed up. It is um, fully backed up um, using two different mechanisms. The first backup um, goes to a, um, another set, a mirrored set of hard disks. And then uh, beyond that, there is also tape storage. So um, it is fully um, Backed up. Yes, uh, sorry, there's just been a question in the chat window. Yes, we can certainly get a copy of the slides. Um, uh, it will be going up on the um, Archer website um, not long after this um, tutorial. But uh, if you're having problems seeing the slides now, I can actually put them up um, immediately if that would be useful. Just let me know. So, um, the file systems, so when you have an account on Archer, you're given a directory on the home file system. Um, now, on Archer, everything is organized by what's called projects. So when you're given a, an account on Archer, the directory is created for you in slash home slash project code slash group code slash username. So I've got an example here on this slide which is slash home slash z01 slash z01 slash Adrian J. So my username when I log in for Archer is Adrian J. Z01 is a project I'm working on and it hasn't got any special project group set up so my project group code is also z01. So when I log in, I log into a directory there and I can create files and delete files and move them around in that place. Um, as we'll come on to talk about project groups, it, it is possible to have um, different project groups here. So instead of being home Z01, Z01, it could be home Z01, Z01 dash something or other in Adrian J. But, but by default, this is what your directory structure looks about, like when you access the machine. So home, you can't see it from the compute nodes. 
but it is fully backed up. So if you've got data that you don't want to lose, um, like your executable, your source code, your setup of directories and things like that, it goes on home, but it's not big enough to store very large amounts of data for, for all the people on Archer. The work file system is the place which the compute nodes can see. It's also a high performance file system, so it's designed to give very fast reading and writing speeds, which is which you need if you're if you're going to be um, running parallel jobs in a live system. But it's important to to note that it isn't backed up at all. This, so it's not scratch space. It's not you know we don't go through and man uh, automatically delete things from there to free up space as time goes on. But it's not backed up. So if there's a disk failure, then you this potential you know potentially you can lose data on work. Yeah, it's very rare, but it, the potential is there. So work, very large file system, designed to be used from the compute nodes to so have your simulation data on it, reading and writing data on it, but it's not backed up. So if you want long-term secure storage of very large data sets, then work isn't the place to do it. And we'll come on to where you should do that. Um, just like with the home file system, each project and each user is assigned a directory on the on the file system. So I haven't put it here, but I'll, I'll just put put it in now. So my equivalent work file system structure um, for my account on my Z01 project would look like this here: slash work slash Z01 slash Z01 slash Adrian J, and that's where I have data. So when I log on to Archer. I go into my home space, I build my executables, I generally copy them across to work where my data is and then I run them from the work file system. So um, the file the, the <coughs> when you usually use uh, Linux or Unix based file systems there are <coughs> commands that you can use to look at how much data you're using in the file system, how big your files are. <coughs> because the work file system is a Lustre file system, there's a special command that enables you to check how much data um, you have on the file system, how big files or directories are. <coughs> that command is the LFS space quarter command. So if you want to check how much um, data, how, how much uh, storage you're using on the work file system, you can use LFS quarter minus you, I mean your username, and then slash work slash whatever project you're in, and that will tell you how much work space, how much of the work file system you're using. Um, likewise, you can work out for a, for a whole project group how much project space it's using. There's a, there's a little bit of an aside here. So <clears throat> this is not uh, information which you necessarily have to use uh, to use uh, Archer, but it, the file system we have, the slash work file system we have, in, is, a, is a high performance file system, but there are ways you can configure it to give you different performance for different usage scenarios. <clears throat> and then uh, the the most important one to be aware of is something called striping. So actually, you look at the work file system, and it looks like one big file system, but there's a lot of hardware which sits behind it. And one aspect of that hardware is that we have a set of I.O. servers, a set of I.O. nodes, which handle taking your data and writing it to disk, or getting your data from disk and sending it back to your job that's running. These in Lustre parlance are called OSTs, sort of virtual I.O. servers. And Archer has 48 of them. Now, they sit in the background. You don't have to do anything special to use them. They're just there. But the thing to be aware of if you're trying to get good performance for certain parallel jobs is that, by default, um, when you create a file on the work file system, it's set up so it's split up across four of these networked um, I.O. servers, four of these OS, OSTs. Um, and 
that will work fine. So it's usually split up into chunks of one megabyte, and those, you, you know, if your file's 10 megabytes, it's split up into chunks of one megabyte in size, and they're parceled out to the different um, I/O servers. And when you go and ask for a bit of a file, the Lustre file system goes and finds where that bit of file is and contacts the particular file server that that file chunks on and gets the data back for you. <clears throat> However, if you're running a large parallel program, which is you know using thousands of cores, and you're trying to write tens of gigabytes of data or read tens of gigabytes of data, if your files are already split up across four I/O servers, you're maybe not going to get the best performance because we have 48 I/O servers across the whole system, and you're only using four of those. So some programs, and it depends on your particularly your the I/O strategy your program has. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Some programs can benefit from changing the default behavior from uh, where the default behavior is using four of these I/O servers to trying to use all 48 of them. And you do that by setting the stripe of the directory or the file that you're reading or writing. Um, so there is a command called LFS get stripe, which will tell you how many, how how your your file or your directory is split up across these I/O servers. So in this example in the slide, I've got a directory called temp in my workspace, and you can see by default that it's striped across four I/O servers. The stripe size is one megabyte, and it, it's got something called a stripe offset. We don't need to care about that. And so if I create a file in that directory, so I've done this command touch and then touch the file called test.dat, it creates a file. And then if I look at the stripe of that file, I can see that file itself has been split up with a stripe count of four. And then it tells me something about which of a particular I.O. servers my file has been sent to. And that's fine. Um, but if you have got a program which is doing parallel I.O., and you're reading to or writing, sorry, reading from or writing to a small number of big files or one very big file, you actually probably want to split that file up across um, all the I/O servers we have and not just four of them. So you can use a command here called LFS set stripe minus C, and then the minus one bit just says set use all the I/O servers you can. Right, you could put 48 in here and do that manually, but minus one does that for you. So LFS set stripe, and I set the, the luster stripe of this directory to be minus one. Then if I do the same command again and try and do this touch test, or that, I've deleted the test file in between these two examples. I can see that when I query the stripe of this file, it's now been split up across 48 I/O servers. So as I say, this can give you really good performance benefits for certain I/O scenarios. So when you're writing, um, when lots of MPI processes or lots of processes are reading or writing to one or a small number of big files, then this can give you really good performance. I was working with a user, um, or have been working with a user uh, on her code where she was seeing quite poor I/O performance on Archer compared to her local system, and it was taking two or three hours to write her files on Archer when she could do it in one hour on her local system. And we we changed the stripe of the directory she was creating her files in to to stripe across all the I/O servers. And that, for the example I was running, took two hours off the runtime. There, so it improved the I/O performance by by a significant amount. Um, I, interestingly enough, she hasn't seen quite the two-hour speed up. She's seen about one and a half hours, um, I think, on the on the speed up. But it, the the I/O performance varies a little bit depending on who um, or what what other people are doing on the system whilst you whilst your codes um, um, whilst your codes are running. So.
we are um, actually at the moment in the process of, of doing a, a little white paper on IO performance and how to get best IO performance on, on Archer. So hopefully in the next few weeks or the next couple of months we should come out with something which gives uh, gives more of an indication to users how to, to utilize the uh, machine uh, IO sensibly. It also should be noted that if your code isn't using parallel IO, so if your code is writing lots of each process writes its own separate file on the system, um, or you're writing lots of small files, you probably don't want to do this striping like this because striping your file across IO servers um, does introduce some overhead because when you go and try and read data or write data, it has to find out exactly which of the IO servers it has to put that data on and that operation takes a little bit of time. So this is really useful if you're reading and writing large amounts of data to a small number of files, not as useful if you're creating thousands of small files from thousands of processes. So there's a bit of give and take in here, but the performance improvement for big simulations we've seen can be very impressive. So it's useful to at least consider what you're doing here. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that you can set the stripe, if you set the stripe for a directory, then any file or subdirectory created in that after you set the stripe inherits that stripe. Things that already exist in the directory don't. They keep their old stripe. If you delete them and recreate them, or if you manually set their stripe, then, then that sets their stripe for them as well. Um, as I say, if you have any questions or, or comments or anything you want to know, just please do either write me a chat message or, or just shout at me. Um, and the slides will be made available on the Archer website uh, shortly after this event. So um, one thing Archer doesn't have is a slash temp scratch space on on nodes, on compute nodes. So some high performance computers do, they have a local disk running each node which you can dump data to, but, but Archer doesn't. This for most people is not a problem. You can just write into your work directory, but there are some Fortran programs, particularly if you've compiled with GNU Fortran and you've opened files with a status equal scratch. Um, uh, attributes uh, that will cause a problem and, and, and to get around this you have to do this manual export g4 transcore temp directory equals and then tell it to put that somewhere in your workspace and, and it can create its own um, create its own um, temporary place there um, by default for so both home and work file systems the permissions the being able to see what files are in, in your directory, who can see your files in your directory, are all set up on a project basis. So if I'm in the Z01 project, then no one else from outside the Z01 project can get in and see my files. Um, and of course, I, I can do things to try and open up my files to, to be viewed by a burning machine, but by default, that's, that's not what happens. So you can only generally see data from other people inside your project if you're like you are not in other projects. We have just, I, I believe today, set up a system, properly set up a system which enables you to share code with or data and files with other people on the system if, if you want to do that. I mean, quite often that's useful for us because you want to help somebody with a problem they're having, you need to see their code, their code's too big to email to you, you need somewhere to put it. So we have these shared directories now on Archer in, in, I think both in work and in home, but someone will correct me if I get that wrong. Um, so either slash work, slash project code, slash shared. So for, in my example, I should have put an example in here, but for my, my directory it would be work Z01 shared. Um, and that can be, sorry, there shouldn't be a dollar there. And that can be, if I put a file in that directory there, slash work, slash z01, slash shared, anybody on the system can go and see that. So that lets me be able to share that with anybody in the system. Likewise, there's also a directory set up to enable you to share stuff with people just in your project. So for me, that would be in slash work, slash z01, slash z01, slash shared. And that will let me share with anybody in my project. Um, so these, if you encounter, so those have just been set up today, I believe. So if you, if you run into any problems with those, um, 
uh, oh look, so Liz is telling me that this is for both home and worker setup. So if you run into any problems with that, just let us know. But there is a facility there on the system to let you share data with other people. So I talked um, before that slash the slash home file system is backed up, but reasonably small. The slash work file system is fast, but not backed up. So where do you put your data? If it's, it's large, but you want to hold on to it for a long time. So there is something called the Research Data Facility, which is provided by EPSERC. Um, this is quite an old picture here, actually, because it still even has Hector on it. But the idea here is to say, look, it's a facility which sits outside any one of these big machines or these big systems. It, it's up and running on its own. Um, and it's there to provide long-term, persistent, and um, backed-up storage of important data um, over time. So it is at the moment, I think, 12, around 12 petabytes of disk with a 30 petabyte backup on it. Um, so the idea here is that if you if you have data you want to keep but, but it's too large to store locally at your own place or on, on home on Archer, then you should be using the RDF for this. Um, the RDF, you can actually access it directly from the login nodes on Archer, it's not viewable from the compute nodes. So, as I said before, if you're running actual jobs on the system, they need to, all the data needs to be in work for your job to be able to see it. But you can see the RDF from the home file system, from the sorry, from the login nodes. Um, and there are a number of different file systems that have been set up inside the RDF, depending on uh, what projects you're in and, and who your funding body is. So. Uh, either slash EPSERC or slash NERC or slash, slash general. And if you have a, uh, a directory in there, if you have a, a, a space inside the RDF set up for you, then you can just copy data directly and using the, the normal copy command from the, from the login nodes and that will copy data across. If you're trying to do move large amounts of data across, I mean, the system, the systems guys on Archer I tend to keep an eye on the login nodes and make sure people aren't spending, aren't consuming too much of their CPU time there because that impacts everybody else's on the login nodes. So if they do see processes which are taking quite a long, a lot of CPU time for a long time, they will tend to kill them. So if you want to shift, you know, tens of gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes of data from Archer onto the RDF, then we suggest you use a serial queues on Archer uh, which you don't get charged for. There's a couple of serial nodes which, which you can just run jobs on um, and use the rsync command and that will copy the data across for you. And then because the RDF is, um, is a facility which sits outside these national facilities like Archer and, and, and other ones like Hector before it, it also has its own login nodes called data mover nodes, or DTN, um, and there are four of these which you and can use to log in from without being on Archer. Uh, although I believe only two of them have grid FTP set up on them. So if you're wanting to use grid FTP to push data in from outside the RDF onto it, which we found, I think, in the past, the fastest way of doing it, then that's DTN01 and DTN02. And it looks like Liz is typing a message to me. All oh, right. Okay. Sorry. I do apologize. There's three. There are three DTN um, nodes available, not four. There you go. Um, okay. So that was what I wanted to say about the the file systems on Archer. Has anybody got any questions before we talk a little bit about um, how the quotas are managed using our, our, our service administration facility? I mean, from my point of perspective, the sort of important things to, to remember are homes backed up, but data on home can't be accessed from the compute nodes. So if you want to any data, you can see, um, if you want any data uh, that your job can see, it needs to be on the workplace. But bear in mind that you shouldn't be using work for long-term secure storage because it's not backed up and actually going to the IDF. Um, so yes, Susan had a question from my first slide. Are the gateway nodes the same as the mom nodes? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So um, 
I was just using a slightly old picture. Um, so in this slide here, the gateway nodes are the MOM nodes. And these are the same nodes that if you do an interactive job, an interactive submission, um, you will get into them. The MOM, it's called the MOM nodes. OK. Right, so the, 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 the final thing I wanted to talk about is how disk uh, quotas are managed um, on Archer, uh, and particularly because we have this service administration facility, this website, which enables people to manage projects, time, and disk quotas, and how, how that works. So um, you can use a safe site to see your disk quotas on the machine. Um, I've put up a screenshot of my page where you can see that I'm a member of a number of different projects and they all have particular usages and quotas. So if I look at my, say, e, my E281 project that I'm a member of, it's got a quota of only 200 gigabytes on home, so you can see it's not massive, um, and 130 gigabytes of that are being used. But on work, it's got a quota of 30 terabytes, and 22 of those terabytes are being used. And you can see that the safe will um, color um, the quotas with a pink color if they're looking like they're getting quite close to being full. So, um, so Z01, we can see that our home quota is um, only got 10 gigabytes spare, but we've got quite a lot of spare space in our work quota. Um, it's important to bear in mind that the values that the website prints out come from the machine, but they're only updated four times a day. So if people are creating large amounts of data or deleting large amounts of data, what you see in this website will not necessarily be 100% up to date. And, you know, if somebody's just suddenly run a job which creates two terabytes of data on slash work, then that won't be reflected in the safe for a little bit, so you may see disparities. So to get the most accurate data on disk usage or disk quotas, you need to use the LFS quota command on the, for the work file system, and, and uh, that will tell you what's, what's going on there. In terms of disk quota in the safe, so if you're managing projects, if, you, if you're running a project, if you're a project manager or a PI, there are two types of, of, of quota um, in the safe. And this is actually the same as we use the safe to manage projects, disk quotas and time quotas, so allocations of time, KAUs. And they're sort of managed in, in a similar kind of way. There's a general group, which is, so in my Z01 project, if we see here, there's a, there's a general well, this picture doesn't really show it very well, but there's a general group which has the same code as, as the project, so Z01. And every member of the Z01 project is automatically a member of that general group. So if you assign a quota of 200 gigabytes to your work, home file system for Z01, and that's a general group, everybody will automatically be a member of that and can use disk space up in there until Z01 quota is finished. There's also a reserve group, so Z01 for me dash reserve, which is set up automatically. No one is a member of that, so no one can use that disk quota. Um, so you can hold disk quota in there, which no one can use, and then and then move it across to the, the main group when, uh, when you need it and as you need it. So it's a way of holding disk quota without letting people use it. And you can do exactly the same with time, so you can keep you know, an allocation of time in a, in a reserve group which no one can use until people have used their time and then um, manage it across. The home file system and the work file system have separate quotas. So they, you, know, you can't say, well, I've got two terabytes free on, on, um, on work, but I, I'm running out of space on home. Can I move some of my work quota onto my home? Is it not work like that? They're, they're two separate things. Um, and it's also then possible to do more complicated things. But actually, in general, for most projects, 
that's sort of all you need to do. Most projects, you have a set of quota, you can keep some in reserve and allocate it out later if you want, and everybody who's a member of a project can use that quota. And for most you know, reasonable sized projects, that kind of works for you. If you're in a very big project with hundreds of members and um, you w need to manage it with, you can manage it with project groups and assign individual users to project groups and assign quotas to those individual groups. Um, but I would stress that for most projects, you probably don't need to do that, certainly initially, uh, because once you start setting up groups, it's very hard to go back from having groups set up. So, um, but, but so if you do have a if you do have a a large project, um, you and, and actually even for small projects, you generally quite often manage the time in that project using different groups. So you'll say, I've been allocated for my whole project, you know, a million killer AUs, and um, but I don't want everybody to be allowed to burn that uh, willy-nilly, so I'm going to put 90% of it in the reserve, and then I'm going to uh, say, well, this user over here, I'm going to give him 100 kilo AUs, and this user over here, I'm going to give him 1,000, and, and manage it that way. That's quite common. Um, and, and you do that on the safe using these project groups. You set up a project group, give it a name, and then you can assign users to it, and you can assign time to it. Those same project groups can be, if you need to, also used to assign disk quota to them. So by default, they're not, but you can if you need to assign disk quota to them. And if you assign disk quota to them, then what actually happens is it goes away and it tells systems to create a new directory on the, on the file system, be it in slash home or work, wherever you set it. So if you created a new group called uh, T01-A, in, in, in this, in this uh, scenario, so my group's called A and it's in the T01 project, then it actually goes away and creates a new directory. So there's now a directory home T01, T01A, and the users you assign to that group also have a, their own user directories created in there. So that then automatically, if they create files inside that subgroup, that T01-A, whatever their username is, those files count for the um, quarter for that subgroup and not the main quarter. Okay? Um, and, and it does this using Unix file groups. So it assigns a, a group to a particular, uh, you know, Unix file group to a subgroup of the project, and then any files a user creates will generally get tagged to that subgroup and it picks that up. Okay, so uh, I, it sounds reasonably complicated. It is a little bit involved. I should stress again, most people don't need to do this. This is for large, complex projects where you've got you know tens, hundreds of users in them, and for, for you know a long time, and, and there's lots of variation in the amount of disk space people are using, and you want to control that. Most people don't need to do that. But if you do need to do that, you can, and you can. Um, you can set it up through the safe and it will be reflected on the system. Um, and then users themselves can then use the churn command to uh, take a file and, uh, and set it with the subgroup so that the uh, disk quota is assigned to that file is assigned to that subgroup. Again, I say this is not what most, need, most projects or most, most users need to do, but it is possible. Um, and then the final way you can actually control disk quota is, is by actually assigning individual users quarters. And this is different from group quarters because you're not allocating a... Um, you, so what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to say that this user can only write 100 gigabytes on this, on this file system. Um, it just puts a limit on the amount of disk space a user can use in a particular file system for that project. Um, as such, it's not, you're not actually sort of chunking up a quarter and giving it to different people. You're just setting limits. It's actually possible that you can, you know, if you set, if you've got a total quarter of a terabyte and you've got 20 users and you, you each say they can write 500 gigabytes, then you know theoretically they can all write much more data than you actually have in the in the project disk quarter. So um, we wouldn't really generally suggest using user disk quarter management unless you know, you really have some very, very specialized users who you really need to control very carefully. 
um, how you do all this um, on the safe is documented on the Archer on, on the Archer website. So there's a the link here to the Archer uh, safe guide, and there's a particular part of it for project managers and project investigators, um, sorry, principal investigators, which tells you how you, you control these things. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, up front, but as I said at the beginning, this is a virtual tutorial, so the idea is that if you've got questions, you've got comments, you've got, it doesn't have to be about the file systems, you've got any questions about anything, um, please just um, let me know, either through the chat window or just, you can talk, you should be able to talk, if you can't, turn your microphone and I'll talk, um, let me know, I may have to change some setting. Does the RDF have a quota on it as well? Yes, the RDF, the RDF does have quotas on it. I haven't gone into detail. I, Liz maybe can um, tell me more. I believe I just managed in exactly the same way as um, for the home and work file system. But yeah, RDF does have a quota associated with it. And you can see what your quota is in the safe. Um, yeah, so Liz says it's managed in exactly the same way. So if you look at my, my, my slide here, I'm associated with a number of projects but not all of them have RDF space. So you can see my Z01 project, there's RDF space in Z01, which is on the general file system on RDF. And then I've, um, we can see that the E281 project also has some space on general, but that doesn't actually look like it's uh, properly set up. And I think uh, in reality, actually E281 was a, was a hectare project, which had early access to Archer and has not moved across properly. So you can see that not all the files, not all the, um, not all the, no, that's not true. Anyway, not all the projects I'm involved with have RDF access, but the, those that do show me um, in the safe what the, um, what the RDF uh, quotas are. Yeah, so uh, Liz has just said in the, in the chat box, not all projects automatically have space on the RDF. Um, so some projects, uh, will automatically have space on, I guess, uh, not all do. So what you need to do if you want space on the RDF is contact the help desk. You can uh, email the help desk or um, phone us up. The, the contact details for the help desk are on the Archer website. Uh, but I can put them in here as well if people, if, it were, if that would be useful. Um, as I say, I'm here for questions or comments or on anything on Archer. Um, and um, I would encourage you to have a look at our website for the training and um, other upcoming virtual tutorials and uh, um, other um, events. We also, I forgot to mention, but we, as well as the virtual tutorials, we also have um, um, what are called um, technical forums every month. So um, they're, they're also available on the website. The last one we had actually for April was on, on a parallel as well, and then we had one before that on vectorization. And so these are sort of meant to be more in depth, a bit more technical stuff. Um, and the PDFs of that tend to be up online as well. Sorry, Susan. Where on the website can you find the technical, the technical forum or the virtual tutorials? All right. So the, if you go to this the, the this link which is on the slide here, so I'll put it in the chat box as well. So if you go to Archer ACUK training the virtual, is that going to come up properly? No, that's, I've missed out that. Um, so the place where you actually went to, to link to this um, session, um, if you go to the bottom of the page there, 
there is all the previous virtual tutorials and they should be um, they should be content from those virtual tutorials as well. I'm struggling to type at the moment. Um, and likewise for the uh, technical forums, I'll put both the links in here. So this is the technical forum one. And uh, this is the virtual tutorial one. And if you go down to the bottom of the page in the virtual tutorial one, um, not, not all of them have the, te the content in them yet, but um, content will go up when we have it in there. OK, a couple more questions in here. So. Is there an automatic way of moving it to the RDF whilst so is there an automatic way of moving data from work to the RDF whilst the job is running? Not currently, um, and I will be corrected by my colleagues if I'm if I'm wrong. So not currently. The the slightly um hacky way to do this um is to what you do is that um whilst you're you submit your parallel job and it's running, you can submit as well a, um, a small parallel job which runs at the same time and does the, does the copying across for you. But it's not easy and it's not easy to, to bring them across. I think Andy has more experience of this than I have. So hopefully he will, yeah, hopefully he will comment in a minute. I can see him writing furiously as I speak. Um, whilst he's writing, there's another question. How is the quota calculated for the shared space? I don't know. That is a very good question. Liz, do you know how the quota is calculated for the shared space? Okay, so going back to the, the original question about copying slash work to RDF, um, the Andy says the NCAR people do this by running the copy command on the post processing nodes whilst their job is running. So the post processing nodes are the is the serial serial nodes. Andy, the serial nodes can basically be the work file system as well. All right, so this sounds reasonably complicated, but you can do it. You can access to the post processing nodes with a parallel job submission script via SSH. Okay, right. Okay, so to um, to to summarise, the serial job, the serial queues can see the see all the file systems. So you can run a job into the serial queues. You can actually SSH directly into the serial queues. So you don't have to go through the queuing system. You SSH directly in there. You run your parallel job. When the parallel job starts, you can run a script on there, which um, cleans up your, which moves your data across whilst it's available. And he says you probably need to set up an SSH pair, key pair, and probably an SSH agent. So it's, it can be done. You can move your work data on the RDF, sort of automatically whilst it's created. It's probably worth getting in touch with us um, to help you through the process. So I'll drop in a, an email to myself, at my email address at the end of the slides, or just into the help desk and say, you know, this is what we're going to do. Um, you know, can you give us a bit of a hand and we can help you through that. Um, but let me know if you have any more questions on that. Um, the other question was how, where the slash shared quote is calculated. Liz says quota is calculated based on the Unix GID and UID of a file, no matter which directory it's in. So basically, it depends on who creates the, the who creates the file in the shared directory. So if someone's creating from a different project is creating files in your shared directory, then their quota will be used for that. Does that answer your question?
But if you want, if anybody wants to ask a question by speaking uh, uh, as well as typing, please feel free to, to jump in as well. And as I said, the, the questions don't don't have to be about the file systems of the idea for anything like that. If you have any other problems you have with Archer at the moment, you can just use this as a help desk session if you want. Just let us know. Liz, this might be a better question for you to answer rather than me. There's, there's a question about a request that's been put in to create a shared space on RDF. Is there any time frame to when that will be available? So I should really say, so both Liz and Andy have also been helping answering this uh, heavily involved in Archer, either on the, the user support side or the, or the, the, um, the trainings, well, not the training, but the, the central support side as well. They're not just my friends who I've invited along. I mean, we'd also be quite interested uh, in people's experiences of uh, parallel performance on Arch. Uh, uh, whether it be MPI or HDF5, NetCDF4, these kind of things. As I said, we, we, we're looking into doing that. Well, we're in the middle of we've started doing a white paper on on IO performance, uh, where we're looking at the MPI IO performance particularly, and we'll try and do some HDF5 and NetCDF4, NetCDF stuff in there as well. But if people have particular experience um, on Archer, that would be interesting as well.